much. But thank you. Thank you. Happy to be the one that got more people to reach this presentation. So, <laughs> IPv6. So the agenda today is just to go through a little bit of the high-level history uh, and theory of IPv6, um, discuss planning, um, some of the migration challenges and strategies people have in deploying it, and uh, probably one of the more important aspects of IPv6, in my opinion, which is uh, IP address management and or DDI, which is DHCP, DNS, and IPAM, IP address management in single solutions. Over the last few years, these tools have been starting to become a little bit more um, commonplace since the address spaces that are people that people are managing with IPv6 are quite large um, and the addresses are just a little bit more uh, tedious to manage. Um, and then some q and if there's any. First of all, terribly sorry about this presentation. It is one of those things that is sort of people have been avoiding as a topic and or even as a skill set because um, the way we think about IPv4 and IPv6 is truly different. Um, in fact, in just the preparating, uh, preparating this presentation, I, I found myself trying to challenge my own um, preconceptions about IPv6. And so, um, so some history and theory. 4.3 billion addresses roughly in the IPv4 space, which we've already, uh, with IoT and many of the other technologies coming to the market, we've already outrun. Now, the way um, the IP border space has been handed out, the five regional um, registries, the rears, uh, already have been handed out all the existing IPv4 blocks. But of those five, only the North American, or not North American, but the US and Canada uh, rear, which is Aaron, has actually handed out their entire IPv4 block. And just chatting with Greg briefly on how some people that own many large blocks of IPv4 addresses have used selling some of those blocks as means of fundraising now that uh, space is exhausted. Um, so facts and figures. 1995 is actually when uh, the standard was, was uh, started to be developed uh, and finally got into an RFC by 98. So essentially we've got 128-bit address um, which yields 340 undecillion addresses. Uh, it's a trillion, 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 basically, is what that adds up to. It's a lot of addresses. Um, Aggregation-based hierarchy. So the way we think about um, prefixes, the network bits and host bits is a little bit different in IPv4. Uh, in IPv6, everything is aggregation-based. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get through some of the slides. Uh, one of the cool things about IPv6 is a stateless address auto configuration, which means uh, without even DHCP, um, you can still have a system of uh, solicitation and advertisement that allows devices to get an address automatically uh, over IPv6. Mm. Security, uh, the IPv6 standard uh, actually has, well, so does IPv4, it can also do IPsec, but IPv6 makes it uh, a requirement. Um, mobility is an interesting factor uh, because unlike IPv4 addresses, you can request a provider independent block of addresses from your uh, rear and you can actually move with your entire block of addresses to a different provider uh, or ISP and still have your block routed to and from. Um, and definitely not backwards compatible with IPv4. So a lot of what I talk about in this presentation is sort of the change of mentality of how we know things in IPv4 and how we start to think about them in IPv6. Uh, the number is so big in fact that my computer did not know the word <laughs> the so um, I thought I had to actually have it learn the word. So of the entire IPv6 space, 86.2% um, of it is still reserved and not even assigned at this point. Uh, the, the global unicast address space, which is the space that is used for public internet routable IPv6 space, uh, is 12.5%. And only 0.02% of that, or 0.2% of that, is what's assigned to the different uh, NICs for handing out to, to different customers. And so those are the different allocations that have been given to each one of the readers. 
Uh, 1.3% is uh, used for local, link local, and multicast addresses. Again, not internet routable. So you can start to see just by how little of the total IPv6 address space that has already been handed out, uh, like how much room there is to grow. There's some interesting stats on Google of the uptake um, of IPv6. And so I've just made that short link there that takes you straight to the Google page with these stats. And this is just as of a couple days ago. Um, but you can see how quickly it started to grow since 2011. So Greg was pointing out a 2011 presentation he saw on IPv6 where people seem to have not been doing anything about it, but after 2011, there's been quite an uptick. So let's talk about the IPv6 address itself. Uh, in IPv4, we have four 8-byte octets. In IPv6, we've got 32 uh, 4-bit nibbles. Um, and so that's a term that's specific to IPv6. Um, each uh, of one of the bits has a value range from 0 to 15, which is why we use a hexadecimal representation in IPv6, the character is 0 through F. Um, also, a hexadecimal is a little bit more readable than if we were using binary, because binary would mean a much longer uh, representation. Um, and then there's some shortcuts built into the representation of IPv6. So you can take an address uh, that normally looks like this, uh, and you can you have a hex set, you have a nibble. Um, you can drop any leading zeros, which shortens uh, the address quite a bit, and then once per address, you can also condense any consecutive zero uh, hex sets uh, into two columns. And so that obviously comes with some challenges because you could have three hex sets uh, with a subnet of a slash 52 or a slash, sub, subnet of slash 64, and it would look like the same address, just the subnet is different. So um, it's important to understand the subnetting. So there's also um, a very specific uh, prefix, which is 2001 colon DV8, uh, which is an RFC uh, that is specifically assigned for documentation purposes. So if you are going to prepare documentation or use examples of IP6 addressing for your infrastructure in documentation, that's the prefix you should use, unless you actually want to use actual addressing. Uh, because every device has uh, well, in the publicly routable uh, IPv6 space, because every device has a, an actual address, internet routable address, so people will prefer not to use those as examples in their actual documentation. Also, um, we know RFC 1918 as the private address space that we NAT to, uh, but in IPv6, pretty much NAT is frowned upon. Uh, we don't want people to do uh, prefix translation. Um, we don't want people, we basically just want to do global unicast addresses um, through and through. So either DHCP assigned, Slack assigned, or manually assigned, uh, but always using uh, global unicast addresses. So a little bit more on the structure. We've got 48 bits um, of the prefix, a 16-bit subnet ID, an interface ID of 64 bits, and the smallest you should ever get for any one segment um, as per the IETF and just anybody that has been talking about IPv6 should be a slash 64 subnet. Um, even your smallest VLAN should not be any smaller than a slash 64 subnet. So that still gives you a lot of addresses. Even point to point links should be configured using slash 64 subnets. So the 48-bit prefix is uh, separated out like this. And so a rear that has a prefix uh, with an allocation like the ones that we saw in a previous slide might give you an allocation uh, that is a smaller one from the specific allocation they have. Now one of the cool things about uh, the portability of IPv6 is you could take, an organization could take their entire block of IPv6 and move to a different country and still have that block routed in a different country. And so that ultimately ends up providing you with a 64-bit 64 64 subnet prefix and a 64-bit interface ID. 
One thing that people uh, are sort of just getting tuned into is the fact that uh, nodes can have multiple IPv6 addresses in addition to IPv4. And so one of the challenges has been, you know, a device that has more than one IPv4 address is seen as multi-homed or what have you, but in IPv6, uh, there are several different types of addresses that have different functions. So you can have a link local address, which is kind of like a, a self-assigned 169.254 address in IPv4. You can have a uh, local, uh, locally assigned address, uh, which is generated from the MAC address of the computer, and we'll talk about the, the UEI64 addresses. Uh, in addition to the uni uh, global unicast address, which is what's internet routable. And so any traffic that's routed to the internet will be sourced from the device's uh, global unicast address. Any traffic that is intended for other local uh, nodes might be sourced from one of the local addresses. So they're used for different purposes simultaneously. These are some of those different types of addresses uh, and sort of giving you a little bit of an IPv4 equivalent for comparison. Um, there is that uh, unique local address, which is what we know as the RFC 1918 space. The global unicast uh, space is the internet routable space. Unlike IPv4, where we have the concept of broadcast, uh, IPv6 only has multicast. So one of the efficiencies that this brings is that all the nodes that were previously uninterested in broadcast traffic now don't have to have to or don't have to listen to it. So you can do one to many traffic with multicast and not have to have a bunch of devices listening for that traffic uh, if they didn't want it or need it. So the typical address allocations uh, go like this. Uh, larger ISPs might get uh, bigger subnets. Um, and because uh, the rears will assign, uh, and there's even a process already available, if you go to Aaron, Aaron's website, or the European rear, I forget the name, uh, you can apply to get your own IPv6 allocation, which is provider independent. And that allows you to move around with your allocation. There's some requirements, and typically means you have to be a certain size of enterprise with multiple sites before they consider giving you an allocation uh, of your own. So this is a typical provider assigned or PA allocation. Uh, your ISP has their own allocation and then they just carve out a chunk of that allocation to give to you. Um, and in the case of an enterprise that has multiple sites, they might actually give you a, a bigger subnet, uh, for example, slash 40. Um, but if you're a single site, then they might give you something like a slash 48, uh, but no bigger than that. So I would imagine in the small business space, for example, most customers might receive a slash 48 allocation from their ISP. Uh, single home networks will typically just get a slash 48. Um, provider dependent allocations are allocations that are given to you directly by the rear and can be used with multiple ISPs. Uh, all of them will route the allocation to you uh, and to the internet and you can move to different ISPs and that block can stay the same. So the reason why this is important is because now you have a bunch of devices on your network that have a prefix that is based on your ISP's allocation or your direct allocation from the rear and the actual interface ID, which is based on a MAC address formed um, allocation or address rather. And so if you move ISPs, you have to basically renumber your entire network because these are full addresses that are fully routable to the internet. And so it causes a little bit of problem. Um, slash 48 per site is what's ideal in the case of an enterprise with multiple locations. And so a headquarters, a regional office, each one of those should get a slash 48. And then from there, you can carve out the smaller segments uh, to do your VLANs or your other inter-office uh, segments. So the different types of addresses, we'll start talking about link local. Um, it's a unicast address and devices that are on the same segment uh, can communicate with each other using link local addresses or self-assigned addresses. Uh, just like you can with 169.254 in fact, they just don't announce themselves to the network um, the way that 
uh, these do. Uh, and it's automatically generated. And so the MAC address of the computer, and we'll talk about that, is modified to get you a 64-bit ID, and that essentially completes the interface uh, address. It is required for neighbor discovery, and because multiple interfaces on your computer can each have their own link local address, they do require zone IDs or, uh, or interface IDs, so we'll talk about those. Uh, unique local addresses um, are ones that you can set manually or are set through uh, DHCP if you're using a non routable uh, prefix. Um, they should remain internal. And again, people are recommending against even considering using NAT uh, because if you are trying to obscure your prefix, um, yeah, I have no, no formal training into why that's such an issue, but everything I've read so far about NAT and IPv6 is, is basically saying don't do NAT in IPv6. Um, oh yeah, and traffic to the internet should always be sourced from your global unicast addresses, which are the internet publicly runnable addresses. The SLAC address. So stateless address auto configuration, it's a modified EUI 64 address. Uh, so you take the MAC address, you separate it into two 24-bit sections, you insert the FFFE in the middle, and you flip the seventh bit of the first octet to give you the modified EUI 64 address. And so how that works is like this. So you have a typical uh, six octet MAC address, and uh, it's a 48-bit 40 bit address. You separate those into two 24-bit chunks, insert FFFE, uh, which is now a 64-bit address. And here's your first, uh, that's the bit you flip. And that gives you the modified EUI 64 address. And uh, so you, you'll start to recognize those when you look, even on your computer, if IPv6 is enabled, and you do like a ifconfig and you grep for inet6, you'll see those addresses uh, even on your local, uh, link local addresses. And you'll start to recognize the FFFE. In fact, let me show you that now. So, if you look at, uh, well, if we look at my MAC address, my MAC address, for example, on EN0, let's look at this chunk here. So you can see, oh, this one did not get, uh, I actually set up static on this one, so I apologize, it's not a good example. Here's a good example. So on this interface, you can see the MAC address uh, 52F179055962. And so 055962 is right here, 095962FFFE and 79F1. And the 52, the bit has been flipped, and so now it reads as 50. And so it, whether it was 2 or whether it was 0, uh, it just gets flipped, uh, and you get a different uh, read from that. And that's the command you saw previously. And this um, scope ID here is uh, lets you know which interface it belongs to, because each one of the interfaces will get its own self-assigned IPv6 address. So uh, I'll do a little bit of a live demo. Um, and I'm using this tool called GNS3, which is um, sort of a network, uh, virtual network environment that lets you uh, play around with stuff. You can download an uh, image of Cisco IOS, for example, and have a virtual machine that you can do some network testing with. So what I'm going to do here is I'll the Cisco router. And if you want a more complex environment, you can add a switch and 
do some other stuff. In this case, I just need a direct connection between the router and a uh, PC. I'm also going to watch the traffic on that interface as we do some of this stuff. <coughs> so it's kind of neat. It just sends the um, interface that we're monitoring on directly to Wireshark, and so you can start to capture and look at some of the traffic. I'm going to look for specifically ICMPv6 um, data. Let's configure our uh, start these guys up. Now the router itself um, is just a flat config. There's really nothing pre-configured on it, uh, and the interface that is connected is actually shut down at the moment. So one of the things we got to do is configure that. So here's our router. Let me bring up our PC as well. So this is a Cisco IOS, 12.4 uh, is fairly recent. Um, here's our interface. You can see it's actually shut down. There's no IP address configured on it. Um, and that's pretty much it for the config. So the first thing I'm going to do is add an address. Or actually, the first thing I'm going to do is enable IPv6. Uh, next thing we'll do is we'll get into the interface and we'll give it an address. I'll use an address from the documentation range. And I'm also going to tell that interface uh, what prefix to announce on the network um, for devices to auto configure uh, to. So I'll say IPv6. Uh, prefix 2001. Oh, I made a mistake in the previous address too. One second. Let me just check to make sure I read that. That's just the prefix I want any Slack uh, interfaces to get. I should bring this up on the screen a little bit. So if we just check that interface, we should have that IP address and our prefix. Now the interface is still shut down, so I should probably not have any traffic here. Um, on the PC, the PC does have its own auto configured uh, address, uh, link local. So you can see the FFFE right there and 666800, 6800, uh, and then 7950, uh, and this zero, meaning zero, has been uh, shortened uh, as per IPv6 but that's a 0 2 with the 7th bit flipped. So that's a modified EUI64 address right there. So what we're going to do here is we'll switch on the router interface. We should see some traffic in Wireshark right away. And so there's the router solicitation from the PC. I'm going to tell the PC to IP auto. And so it's gone and picked itself uh, up an address using that prefix that we're now announcing from the router. And so if I go back to Wireshark, we should be able to see 
some additional traffic. And here's our router, router advertisement. Let's have a peek at this traffic here. So here's the flags. Uh, for Slack to work, you need the managed address configuration to not be set. Um, the other configuration to not be set in addition to the prefix auto configuration flag to be set, which it is. So that's how this device now, show IPv6, has the link local address, also has the global scope address using the prefix we're announcing, uh, and we should be able to ping the router from here. humans were sacrificed. So as far as interface assignments, this is sort of just a guideline as to how you think about assigning your VLANs because in IPv4 we, we have sort of our own uh, preconception of like, okay, well, you know, my typical subnet will be a slash 24 and I'll put my servers in the first 10 addresses and I put my uh, printers in the last 20 my switches here, my uh, WAPs here, and so on. And so this gives you a sense of like what size of subnets you should be using um, and how to think about it. Now, the, one of the main things is really to stick to the nibble boundaries for address legibility, because one of the things you can do is you can start to shorten addresses um, as long as you're sticking to those. So let me show you an example. So if a company with three buildings, um, where each building has its own slash 52. We're using this number one on the uh, first nibble of that hex depth to say, hey, this is building one. Uh, we're just using it as an identifier. Uh, building two has that, uh, building three has that. And then the last three nibbles of that hex depth we're using to identify our VLANs. So I can start numbering them as such, one, two, three, probably go up to 999. Uh, if that's how many VLANs I needed. Um, what's interesting is right now I'm talking about it and thinking about it in sort of in a decimal location. However, uh, you do have a hexadecimal characters here. So in reality, you have all these additional VLANs uh, that are present between nine and 10. Um, once you flip from this nibble to this nibble, you're actually going from nine, then A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, of course, you can't have VLAN IDs with letters, and so you have to figure out some other numbering scheme uh, for labeling those VLANs. But it gives you a little bit of growth opportunity, or in some cases, I've been seeing people talking about using those, um, the letter part of the hexadecimal character for management VLANs or for things that are not necessarily visible to, uh, to staff and or uh, just regular users. Does that make sense? Why you would use the nibble boundary? Obviously, if you don't, then your addresses start to get a little bit more complicated because you'd have to consider the entire hexadecimal 16 characters uh, in your addresses. Whereas here, we can sort of think about it in a decimal way, even though it's really not decimal, but it just allows it to read a lot better. So this is much easier to keep track of which VLAN you're on by using this as your location identifier, and this as your VLAN identifier, if you will. All those heads nodding. Yes, that makes so much sense. So uh, forward and reverse DNS mapping. Uh, the IPv6 space can share your forward zones, no problem. You can actually host quad A records on the same zones that you do all your forward uh, lookups for IPv4. Um, However, the reverse zone is different, and the reverse zone is ip6.arpa, and so you do need to maintain a different zone file for the reverse records. Um, and so this is what a typical forward DNS zone looks like. You can share both IP4 and IPv6 records. In a reverse uh, zone, this is what a typical um, address looks like. And so there's no abbreviations um, of the address in the reverse zone, so you do have to account for every one of the, of the bits. So if we look at the previous address, as you do, so it was 2001, DB8, and such, 
So here's 2001 0 DB8 and the remainder of the address. And one of the cool things you can do if you're manually managing your zones is you can actually set an origin uh, and basically shortcut the, the, the rest of your records so that you don't have to always type in the long uh, PTRs and you can just use a shortened version of the PTRs by adding the origin. But hopefully you start to see where having a tool that does this for you automatically might be useful, and so uh, we'll get into that. So some of the interoperability challenges, dual stack networks, uh, tunneling, and translation. So dual stack networks are quite simply just a node that has both IP4, IPv4 and IPv6 addressing. Uh, tunneling is the ability to um, reach IPv6 nodes uh, on an IPv4 backbone. And so let's just go through these uh, tunneling. So what you do is you encapsulate your IPv6 packets inside of IPv4 packets, and you send your IPv4 packets across the IPv4 backbone, and then eventually you can reach your IPv IPv6 uh, destinations. You do need a, a tunnel broker for that. Uh, Hurricane Electric is one of the more popular ones. They provide a free tunnel broker service if you want to be able to address IPv6 hosts using the IPv4 backbone. Um, and so on that address, you can sign up. They've seen a, a big uptake in signups as well. Uh, but I, I should say that this really is temporary. And the idea is, as soon as you have native support for IPv6, uh, to definitely get rid of any tunneling technology you might be using. Um, NAT 6.6, just don't do it. We don't want to get into prefix translation. One of the things you do have the ability to do is to use privacy headers in your uh, addresses so that you can not give away your MAC address, for example, uh, if you want to protect the identity of a specific host because the modified EUI 64 still makes it pretty obvious what the MAC address of that device is. So what is the business case? Um, I mean, you could argue that many new services may come online, uh, perhaps offering only IPv6 connectivity, um, competitive advantage. Uh, I think we are in inevitably moving to the IPv6 space, and you know how soon we get there individually or with our businesses might make the difference in being able to take on new technologies or being able to open your own networks up to Internet of Things or large quantities of devices. And by starting sooner, of course, you can reduce some of the costs and risks of a, of a transition done under the gun, um, just because it gives you a little bit more time to plan. And so people still argue, oh, but we have lots of IPv4 addresses. But there's lots of reasons to move to IPv6, uh, some of which are uh, different kinds of families, getting rid of broadcast addresses, which is really great. It reduces a lot of the, um, the heavy traffic on networks, since broadcast traffic is sent to all nodes or all devices. Um, path to you is interesting. You can actually set the don't fragment bit in IPv4 currently as well, but that sort of ends up in a big, uh, long back and forth between routers and devices to tell them, hey, no, you can't send, if you don't want to fragment this uh, packet, you have to send me something smaller, and that device keeps trying until they can find the right MTU. In IPv6, uh, they actually get the MTU response back from the router, and then the very next attempt will be at the right size uh, in order for that uh, packet to be able to fit. Mm. Some of the mind shifts, again, I've been talking about this since the beginning of the presentation, is uh, don't try to think of IPv6 in the same terms that you do IPv4 because they're truly just entirely different beasts. Um, the non-human friendly hexadecimal notation in quartets is just going to be something we have to get used to or we have to start to manage better using some of the tools and solutions that help you manage that. Um, the different types of addresses. Right now, when we think of a self-assigned IP address in IPv4, it's typically in the context of, oh, I don't have a connection. 
but in IPv6, link local addresses are very much used for uh, local segment communication. So getting used to the idea that those addresses are actually useful uh, is interesting. Um, ideally, static IP addresses should, as much as possible, not be used. Again, the longer address structure, uh, the difficulty in tracking them will probably make things unnecessarily difficult. Um, but you can provide a prefix. Uh, you can set still some static addresses if you need to, things like servers, printers, etc. Uh, I will definitely probably see a lot more hostname based addressing uh, being used going forward to try and get rid of um, the challenges with static addressing. But because every address is unique, once you know that address, it actually won't change. Um, through Slack and auto configuration, uh, you will get an address that gets an automatic prefix, but once it gets that prefix, your address stays the same. Uh, so definitely a process, and you'll want to just have the uh, time to build the expertise and the skill set with the people working on these projects. Uh, and I think the most important factor is for sure uh, the management aspect of it. Uh, whether you're just doing IP address management, the shops with Windows already have that built into Windows Server, so you can turn on that uh, server role and actually have built-in IP address management. And uh, as of late, uh, the DDI tools that are becoming more and more popular are giving a lot of uh, sort of simplified management of all three components, DNS, DHCP, and IP address management. <coughs> so as far as planning is concerned, uh, when should you start planning? Well, now would be great because really it's one of those things that is a long-term project and the sooner, the, the sooner you start to plan for it, the, the more time you have to actually do your rollouts. Um, so, important to realize, though, really, you just don't turn it on. It does require a lot of planning, especially on the security side. The reason is your firewall rules that apply to IPv4 will not apply to IPv6. It's a completely different stack. So you have to basically redo your entire security process uh, with IPv6 to make that work. A three-phase approach, um, prepare. Uh, external adoption and internal adoption. So one of the easiest things people are doing um, with the, the external adoption is, for example, to get their public website on IPv6, for instance, and start to learn how that works and how that causes issues or, do, or doesn't. Uh, sorry, your preparation uh, phase. Uh, obviously, management needs to be aware of the long-term need to, to start moving to IPv6, getting your staff trained, stakeholders, uh, make sure your ISP supports it. Make sure you're not intending to change ISPs in the near future if you're planning to roll out IPv6, if your possible other ISPs don't support it yet. Um, start working with vendors. One of the thing, interesting organizations that drives a lot of change in this respect is that now uh, the, the US government, uh, at least on the military side, has started to mandate uh, any new stuff be rolled out with support for IPv6. And so some of these things start to make vendors uh, bake the IPv6 support into their products as well. Getting your IPv6 allocation for the larger, larger organizations, the sooner you can get an IPv6 allocation given to you, the better, because you can start to actually plan and test uh, and create a plan. Some of the challenges, of course, is to try and get rid of your IPv4 thinking. Uh, one of the biggest things is address conservation. You know, in IPv4, you're given a block of addresses and, oh, we gotta use as few of them as possible. You're doing NAT, you're doing all these other things to try and not use your address space, uh, but that's really not an issue in IPv6 given the, the sheer size of the address space. External adoption, again, try rolling out IPv6 with your public website. Um, some of you might know I have a software as a service uh, tool called Monkeybox, and one of the things that we did early on, uh, we host this with Rackspace, and Rackspace does have IPv6 support. So we turned on IPv6, we created quad A records for our, uh, our domain name, our uh, actual app uh, host name, and we got some reports from users that were on AT&T's LTE network on their mobile devices that they would try to reach the service and uh, the page would try to load but then just go dead. 
And so we couldn't figure out for the longest time what the issue was because as soon as I had that person go to like, oh, what's your IP address? And we're looking for uh, those IP addresses and, and logs and stuff to see if there's a problem, if the connection was being closed, et cetera. Um, we couldn't find anything. And so it turned out to be the fact that we had bought a IPv6 records in our DNS zone was causing those devices to look up the IPv6 address, see there was one, and try to route to it, but not actually have a proper route to get to it. Um, and so the, one of the interesting things about the IPv6 spec is that if your device has IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, the RFC specs say it should prefer the IPv6 address. And so if you can get uh, a response uh, or a host name uh, looked up in IPv6, then it'll actually try to use that first. Uh, that's where the happy eyeballs RFC comes in. Uh, the internal adoption, again, the reliance on NAT uh, is probably going to cause a little bit of a stir. Just getting away from that thinking and that behavior is going to be very difficult, uh, I think, in a lot of cases. Uh, people assuming that it's complex, but it's really just a matter of some better planning and, um, and again, the change of security scopes, because now you have to redesign your security to include IPv6 as well. So these are some of the IPAM or IP address management options that I've come across through my research for this talk. Um, of note is uh, InfoBlox. Uh, I've actually seen some demos of it and it looks like a really cool tool. There's a couple of open source ones, uh, NIPAP and PHP IPAM. And of course for those with Windows Server, it has it built in. Um, and there's some other products that do it as well. Um, some special thanks to Tom Coffeen. He's uh, uh, an evangelist for IPv6 at Infoblox, and uh, his book that's on O'Reilly is um, largely the source of all the info for this talk. Uh, I've got my slides and a couple of white papers in uh, at that link, and that's my info. Well, that's that's my talk.